Hi everyone, welcome to the road gateway for free. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the cards and emails and calls and so forth. Okay, let's have Hudson, four way, Donna, Sarah. Good morning, good morning. I'm pleased to be here to speak to the United States of America and to the Republic for which she stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I forgot to bring my phone up here, so help me not mind. Isn't it true? 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 Isn't it in any way, the social is at our home today from six to eight. Our address is on the sign up sheet, which is 266 Worth Out Drive. It's off the Clover Lawn. So I have a clean house. <laughs> so please come. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, inspiration. Great, Millard. Blake Bird would have appreciated this. I drew some bots on a woman who lived 500 years ago. The the Second, surround yourself with good friends and mentors. And certainly less than we try to give to our children. Third, take, take yourself and life lightly. It's much easier to do it that way. And finally, something that most people don't know about, but there's actually humor in the writings of the Christian faith. This woman was a Christian woman, and she is writing from one place to another. I fell off the donkey she was riding and fell into the mud and broke her leg. And she looked in her thought where she prayed and was known for. She said, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few. <laughs> Can you have some visiting Rotarians today? Here's your hand. We have any guests in the house. I have with me today my friend Denise Kipper. She's fairly new to town. She's been here about a year and uh, she's one of my camping sisters. I'm Mike, your guest speaker today, and I have two friends visiting from Portland, Craig and Rose. Craig and I have been friends since we were 13, so uh, over 10 years ago. <laughs> Serena Mori, I got our executive director for Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, Steve Wise, as my guest. Let me introduce a visiting guest who was a member before Reverend Martin is here. This is my husband, Sean Healy, um, and he came 
I think it's me, so I'm excited to be some help to Baskin here today. Um, yeah, we both have been here for about five years. I know, so I want to know. The end of the room is that she is on her way. My wife, Jennifer, will be joining us. So, all right. Okay, great. Okay. Wow, that's true. Okay, so the announcements. I'm going to go first and then come on up. Um, I just already said thank you for the cards and calls. So I was sick. Thank you very much. We know that we've lost and I heard and we have a couple of uh, cards passing around to send to his wife, Kathy. She preferred to do very well. And um, that's just a big loss for us. Um, so thank you for signing those and keeping them moving. We're making progress on June the 5th, trying to decide which school we will honor this year. Uh, the district conference May 16th event on making progress. And I just wanted to share something about Porch Fest again. The Bigger Metro Club just finished their annual fundraiser, and they were very happy that they, after expenses, cleared $30,000. And they're twice as big as we are. So it's just another chance for us to appreciate what an accomplishment it was that we cleared 55000 this year. <laughs> we're hoping to do that again, but that was pretty exciting. Uh, eventually, Dean Marie is going to offer to do a uh, tutorial on DAC TV for those of you who don't know how to do it. Okay, come on up, we've got some other announcements. Okay, so if you're noticing that all of the fruit trees have got lots of fruit on them, and you don't think you can eat them all, uh, I would like to suggest you call the food bank because they will come out and they will pick the food for you and then they'll distribute it amongst uh, the different accounts. And the number to call is 541 429 5555. Thank you. I just noticed there's a big coral snake up here on the head. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's a parking lot sale happening on October 19th. And if you are part of a nonprofit and would like to get rid of the stuff that you have stored in your cupboards, or anywhere in your garage. Um, you don't have to be a nonprofit to participate. You can just be an individual or a family. Uh, it's at the big parking lot in front of the clock shop, which is between A and B streets on 6th. So uh, if you're interested, I put flyers on the table. Okay. Good afternoon, um, I'm Debbie and me, um, all things social. Um, so this is all social information. Just a reminder, the address tonight, 266 Swarthout Drive, um, six o'clock. It's, it's starting a little later this evening, just, just take note of that. Um, I'm going to pass the sign-up sheet. We were going to Stop the sign sheet, but you know what? Don has a really clean house. Uh, and so anybody that wants to come tonight, come and see us. So I'm going to pass this around and, and please uh, join us if you can. And just uh, save the date. Tim Sweeney and his wife Jennifer have, are working on a, a party for the 31st of October. That's an event that we celebrate in this country sometimes. So get ready for, for your costume and uh, come in and have a trick or treat night at um at the Sweeney home and more to come on that. We don't want to get our socials confused here. One more course that I don't know if you all saw on the scene this week when we looked at the best of 24 course chefs got mentioned twice. One was for music and the other was for fundraisers. So yeah, this is pretty awesome. And it's just a reminder for those um, older people who like to get out and do things and be active out there. It's Saturday. Some of you signed up and got recruited to go out to the Boys and Girls Club in Kirby to help them do a cleanup out there. And Zara, I believe you and Claudia and Brenda are signed up from 1232. So they want to even remind you. Um, I did a little earlier. So that's out in Kirby if you can't miss it. And then I just wanted to say I don't have a sign up sheet yet, but I did get a signed up. For cleanup on the park level, we have a road that we have done in the past that was a sign saying clean up and how that people see the pictures not June. So being in charge of that, I reserve November 2nd 
Saturday morning and we do what we do is we have a group of people that meet at um, Elmer's in the morning and have breakfast together and then we just do a cleanup up and down from here. I think it's the bridge on the carpet. So I would get a sign-up sheet for that next meeting, but keep that on your phone. There's no other stuff on Saturday morning. One more. Um, Seawise is what we're talking about yesterday. And you keep reminding me, I completely forgotten. Uh, next week on one Saturday, October 5th, is the Land Conservancy's annual conservation celebration. Big event, you know, fundraiser, probably our biggest fundraising event of the year. It's at the Ashton Hills Hotel. Uh, starts at five o'clock. Um, you can get tickets on online, then conservation.org. I think you are our um, email address. Right. Thank you, sir. Sure. Sure. Thank you, sir. Sorry. But anyway, it's a great event. Lots of fun. And uh, yeah, come if you can. Thank you. Thank you. What are you going on? I think we're ready for our speaker. We're still getting the cards circulating. Okay. Uh, Dan Biston, who's our speaker? Thank you. It is a a thought partner, and there isn't anybody that thinks like him. Uh, I, you know, I was reading him about the author of his most recent book, book, book which he heard about um, a few months back. Um, and I can't even begin. All the things he's done, I mean, just introduce him. He's going to tell the story because he tells it much better than, than I tell everything. So please join me in welcoming Mike Amaranthus. Thanks for having me. Um, I uh, always enjoy this group. It's a very intelligent group. I don't hold any punches when we talk about scientific stuff, but you guys seem to be very technically advanced when it comes to uh, this presentation. So uh, when I was in high school, I could have a high school buddy here um, in Portland, but when I was in high school, I used to stock produce at the grocery store. And I was stocking oranges one day. And this uh, lady, young lady with a little baby, about a four-year-old girl came into the store. And she was in the shopping cart. And she was screaming like crazy on top of her lungs. Everybody in the store was looking at this little girl, trying to get out, screaming, yelling. So I was stocking oranges, so I took over an orange and gave it to the girl. And she stopped screaming. And the mother was so relieved, and the store was so relieved. Um, the little girl came over and she was smelling the orange and staring at the orange and smiling. And, and so the mother said, Well, what do you think of that young man who gave you the orange? And the little girl held the orange up. His big, beautiful blue eyes. She held the orange up and she said, Peel it. <laughs> so I never got my thank you from the little girl, but. Would you like to thank you more? Yeah, could I do that? Very nice, Anyway, I never got my thank you, but thank you for having me. Um, it's going to be kind of interesting topic here. Uh, by facing it like towards the computer. Towards the laptop. Towards the laptop. I have to put that one. Press them down. There it goes. So, exciting presentation. I've been talking about climate change for a while. Uh, my friend reminded me that um, we've been chit chatting about this for over 40 years. And my first presentation is actually. Um, about 1980 um, in China. And okay. go. go the other yeah. way. Go the other way. <laughs> the down button. Oh, the down button. Down button. I know it's weird. Down okay. button. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Hard work. I, I talked <laughs> in China about climate change. I didn't realize back in those days, it's actually 1990. 1990, that uh, nobody spoke English in China. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
So the lights go on, lights are already on. <laughs> There's a lot more interest in climate change now. Obviously, the world has changed in those 40 years since the first talks. And, uh, we've learned a lot more about climate change, et cetera. So I'm gonna give you an innovative um, approach to what people could do. People always ask me what can I do for climate change? And there's always the, you want to drive less and all those kind of things. But there's some really things that you can do in your home, garden, and landscape to mitigate climate change. So that's the impact. And I'm going to talk about the under, underground connections, all that. Just a little background. The CO2 levels in the atmosphere increased 15% since it started the industrial revolution. So we've gone from 280 parts per million to 420 parts per million. It's happened pretty quick. You see a lot of turn to the increase. And the Earth is definitely warming. There's no question that the Earth temperature is increasing. And with that, it's done all kinds of things like wildfire, wildfire, drought, extreme climate events, rising sea levels, rising sea temperatures, rising global temperatures, food insecurity. We're seeing the effects now. So the world is changing more rapidly. And one of the ways, one of the ways we can change is to look at ways that we can do in our sort of daily activities to help mitigate climate change. Yeah. But we're seeing the effects um, in terms of climatic events, even in our region. Uh, this year, the state of Oregon will have over a million acres burned in wildfires. It's two years in a row we've gotten over a million acres. It's historically, it's been pretty devastating wildfires. And of course, hurricane intensities Short intensities have, have increased dramatically in the last 30 years. So we're seeing the effects now. And in other parts of the world, the big effects are desertification, food insecurity, uh, water shortages, etc. So it's happening pretty rapidly. But most people don't realize that most of the carbon, we're talking about uh, carbon out the CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases. Causing most of the problem. That 75% of the world's carbon is actually underground. There's more carbon, there's three times more carbon in the soil than there is in all the living plants and animals on there. And actually, there's more carbon stored in soil than all of the atmosphere and vegetation in the bottom. So, soils are these incredible reservoirs of carbon. And the question is, how do we get carbon through the soils? How do we have to energy the soil? There will, there will be no test on any of this. <laughs> it's kind of diagram for French people. Uh, basically, the way the carbon dioxide moves from the atmosphere back into the soil is through photosynthesis. So the carbon dioxide is fixed by plants, and about 70% of that carbon is fixed from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's allocated below that. So plants are the mechanism. We get carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil. And live plants are how the pumps that pump the CO2 in the atmosphere into the soil, the soil carbon. And it's interesting how quickly you can change a soil's carbon content through your kinds of soil practices. This is from the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. And they did a 20 this side by side trial, 12 replications. So they have organic practices with mycorrhizal fungi, compost, cover crops for 20 years, and then 20 years of inorganic farming, and conventional farming, side by side products. And they average over a thousand pounds of carbon per acre into the soil using those methods. You multiply that for times 200 million acres of farmland in the United States, which makes a really major difference in terms of the amount of carbon you put. A 0.1% increase in the environment not in the soil weighs approximately it's about 4,000 pounds per acre. So even a tenth of 1% of the carbon content is added into the soil. That's 4,000 pounds per acre. So it's a, it's a great way to make a difference in terms of getting, um, getting this uh, carbon into the soil. And the way nature has done it historically is with these fungi, these mycorrhizal fungi. I talked to you guys about my project in the past, but they create this web, like a spider web in the soil, 
And they're actually the roofs that are on the roofs. And they, they allocate a bunch of carbon to these fun dikes in the soil. In fact, fun dikes store a third of the world's CO2 emissions every year. So this mycelial network, these threats in the soil, store over a third of the total carbon dioxide that's produced annually on the planet. That's more than China emits every year. So this is, we always knew they were important, but this study and other studies like that have just come out in the last five years. So we know that these fungi in the soil, they really made a difference in terms of getting into the into the soil. And we did it year for year at mycorrhizal applications and other mycorrhizal companies as well. You put the seeds of the fungi near a plant root and they sprout like seed sprouts and they form these threads into soil. So you can see the difference between on the left, a non inoculated plant versus the plant on the right with all of the, the hyphae and the mycelium associated with it. Just adding a few seeds of the fungus into the soil. And that happens in just a couple of months. And so you would never need to do this in natural areas. Natural areas are reservoirs of below ground biomass and carbon. If you were in a uh, redwood sand, you would never need to add mycorrhizal fungi because there's so much there already. That's how these trees can get 250 feet tall, eight foot in diameter, last for a thousand years without any input, without irrigation, without fertilizer. They, they have a, a natural system that develops all of this biomass below ground and helps mediate them against any kinds of changes. So these are very stable systems and they are huge reservoirs for carbon in the soil. This is where all the carbon in the soil is stored in these magnificent natural ecosystems. So conserving these ecosystems is very important in not putting more carbon dioxide into the ocean. But a lot of things we do as humans negatively affects this fungal mycelial mass. The grass, they have to decide chemical fertilizers, especially tilling, takes the carbon out of the soil and puts it into the air. So, these are very common practices that we use in agriculture, horticulture, nurseries, and landowners uh, that are releasing carbon into the atmosphere. I became aware of this uh, back in 19. I moved up here. I came straight out of Berkeley. I didn't really know I didn't what I was doing. They put me, um, part one of my jobs was growing these seedlings for reforestation. Back then, the Forest Service was clear cutting a lot. We were planting trees in the forest. Over 100 million trees a year were being planted. But we were growing these trees like corn in these agricultural settings without mycorrhizal fungi, so they were often stunted. You can see some trees are growing normally, and other trees are not growing. Uh, and growing right, and so the trees that weren't growing right were phosphorus deficient. <laughs> so the, all the experts say just add more phosphorus to your soil, but there was a tremendous amount of phosphorus in the soil. It was just what we get into the plant. So you know, after three or four years of just bombarding these soils with fertilizers and chemicals and pesticides, trying to kill all the diseases that we had in the soil, finally I went to a guy named Jim Trappy at Oregon State University. And he said, well, just take the soil from the native forest and put it in the beds, and you'll put the mycorrhizae back in the soil and treat it to grow normally. I thought, who is this crazy guy? I don't know anything about this. So we put it in the soil diet. And so um, we did it, and it worked. In fact, we started using just mushrooms and the pump balls from the forest, not carrying this heavy soil around. And we did that, and we knocked it in the trees, and we got all the trees to grow normally, like the trees on the right and the trees on the left, where you go. Phosphorus deficient. And more importantly, the survival rate of these trees when they were planted in the forest went from 50% to 90% plus. So I was focused on this idea of what these fungi could do for plants and what they could do for soils. And so we started looking at all these degraded lands and trying to get plants established on highly eroded lands, landslides, old surf paths, et cetera. And tremendous amount of success in these areas. And then we started looking at artificially like urban and suburban areas, crazy places like Las Vegas, terrible climate, non-native plants, really compacted soils, ice salt. These are really horrible places and have really good success getting plants established on the building of herbicides. 
And it was the fungus that was doing the work below the ground. It's doing all the heavy lifting. And it turned out that a lot of these sites were really accruing carbon in the soil and went back to memory. And part of it was this chemical called lamolin. That's a sticky substance that those threads leave in the soil. And that molecule is 45% carbon. And so it gives soil that dark color, the nice loose structure that gets carrying water into the soil. Because good, good soil has a lot of pore space. And that lamolin, that sticky organic glue that the mycorrhizae produce, takes the soil particles together to get a structure, which allow these big pore spaces to let air and water into the soil. So it's about 40% of the world's carbon, soil carbon is actually associated with this sticky substance that these mycorrhizal fungi would be still in circulation as well. These are tomato plants. We started using the fungi for, for agriculture about 2000 and three, and it started producing here in Grand Pass. And then we did, we put over a million dollars in the trial all over the western United States and essentially the United States. But the tomato on the right has no fertilizer and no mycorrhiza. And the one in the middle is fertilizer only, and the one on the left is mycorrhizae and fertilizer. So the mycorrhizae help the fertilizer get into the plant and not leach into the water or at the bottom of the pot. And similar trial on Bermuda grass, the right is no mycorrhizae, no fertilizer. The next one over to the left um, is fertilizer only, is uh, mycorrhizae only. The one set from the left is mycorrhizae and fertilizer, and the right is fertilizer only. And the reason why I'm showing the pictures is it shows that mycorrhizae helps get the fertility out of the soil and utilize it. It doesn't allow it to wash away into streams, rivers, lakes, et cetera, groundwater. So it's a really efficient way of maximizing efficiency and also for water because these threads go out of the root tips into the surrounding soil and into the smallest surrounding soil. So they can get water out of these really tightly held situations. So it's a great way to prevent drought stricken plants. Also, water use. So in the old days, it was easy for homeowners to utilize these products for your own um, lawns and your gardens. It's a lot easier to use. There's a lot of good products out there. Uh, the cost of the tenth of it was when we first started using these products. I've been out of business for seven or eight years, and I see all kinds of new products available, home and garden stores, on the internet, et cetera. So it's a lot easier to find these. Basically, you're putting the seeds of the fungus like on the left there, and you're watering it into the plants, or you mix it into the soil. And the plant. It's very expensive, easy to do the work. And you can get powders, or granulars, or liquid materials to do that. There's other things you can do to put carbon into your soil and get it out of the air. There's compost, and cover crops. A lot of you garden are able to use these methods, uh, having perennial plants, adding manure. Um, and if everybody did this, Everybody did this in the garden. It could really make a difference. Because 25% of households have gardens. And the typical, uh, if all of them put a thousand pounds per acre per year into their gardens, that would equal 2.1 million pounds of carbon dioxide in the United States. The typical, typical car releases 9,000 pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere. So if everybody did the organic gardening methods in your yard, it's the equivalent of taking 230,000 cars off the road. Really, really good thing to do. I'm a little worried about the camera if I go too long, if I'm going to get <laughs> a shed <eater> or something. <laughs> Similarly, if you, there's 40 million acres of lawn plants. So if we all use these methods on lawns, that would put 40 billion pounds of CO2 into the ground or 160 billion pounds of CO2 sequestered uh, in the ground. So 
that's a huge amount. So if you get all of these bonds with fungi and in input, it's the equivalent of taking 11 million cars off the road. And it would be healthier lawns and healthier landscape. That's its lawns, that's not what it's here. So what individuals can do, just to leave you with the full, full bullets of what you can do in your own love yard and landscape garden. Avoid tillage. When you till the soil, you mix oxygen in with the carbon in the soil. Oxygen with carbon creates carbon dioxide. And tilling is the biggest effect on the planet in terms of releasing CO2 in the atmosphere. Eat organic food. Uh, organic food has been dozens of studies that show that from uh, energy, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions, that organic growing methods release less CO2 than uh, conventional. Uh, uh, agriculture. Green cover. Anytime plants are alive and green, they're pumping the soil full of carbon. So the don't have fallow periods, have green cover in your garden during the winter. Uh, don't leave areas bare. Uh, mycorrhizal inoculants are a good way of getting these fungi working for you. Uh, again, on twitching and spirit layer. A lot of the chemicals that we use in home and garden situations require a lot of fossil fuels to make. They also kill life in the soil. So we're using a lot of the chemicals that are sold at some of these places that are really kind of destroying the, the life in the soil and are, are also uh, CO2 users. Add compost to your soil, um, add uh, manures to your soil, any kinds of organic inputs into your thing, uh, into your soil is actually Store carbon in the soil. Perennial plants, again, are pumping the soil full of carbon. Most of the carbon is in the top layers of the soil. So if that's eroded off, you're losing a lot of carbon. So protect your soil surface. Support conservation areas, because a lot of these forests that are mature are tremendous storehouses of carbon. It'll support restoration of ecosystem or maintenance of ecosystems. And so those are the good things. Um, if you want to learn more about fungi, I've got this guide where you go to the website, try to die. Um, <laughs> okay. There it is. And you can get it, uh, it's on Amazon, obviously, and Oregon Books has it. Uh, River Nursery, Strange Co op, REI. And there's all kinds of stories about how to make your own medicine, how to certain fungi, certain medicinal fungi, which ones are poisonous, which ones are dangerous lookalikes, which are the good edible ones in our area, and a lot of essays by local people. So what I love about this method of using your garden and your landscape and your lawn is there is to store carbon. Is that can make you see if you make a huge difference in terms of getting CO2 in the atmosphere. And it makes for healthier soils, healthier food. It's kind of a win win situation for everyone. Thank you for your time. Uh, any questions? Do I have time for questions? Yes, absolutely. Yes. How does the rain in Oregon affect your garden? Would you reach the soil out? How does the rain in Oregon help your garden? Helps it a lot. Yeah, not <laughs> irrigating, so yeah. In the that, winter, does it leach out all these different? You no, know, because the threads are, are connected to the roots of plants, so the threads are stable. That's why we love it as a part of the same because it's stable. It's not washing out. I think carbon doesn't really rinse through the soil because they're large organic molecules, and they don't really leach out. What does leach out is nitrogen, and that's a big problem. It's a big problem for deep wells. Big problems with the road river, big problems with lakes and streams. That's why you get these algae blooms. Phosphorus that leaves out of the soil is also leaves out. Mm -hmm. One pound of phosphorus will create 40 pounds of algae. So that's why you can use like non phosphate detergents. It's really good because phosphorus is the real problem. That's why the Gulf of Mexico basically died. The Mississippi River and all those agricultural fertilizers go down to Mississippi, they go out to New Orleans. There's a 400 mile in the Gulf of Mexico where the 
for the city to come get. There's a 400 mile hypoxia dump. There's so much algae, when the algae dies, it consumes it takes oxygen to decompose the algae. It takes all the oxygen down a lot, so there's no oxygen available for aquatic life. So, in about 50% studies show that 50% of the nitrogen is put on to a critical agricultural field. Only half of it's utilized, the other half washes away. Yes. Me? Yeah, but either way, no, it depends on that. What's a good green cover for a decomposed granite? See, the DG, the decomposed granite, is really tough soil. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's not that yeah, it's your road is terrible. It's a lot of road. So, something that's hardy, like an annual, like a perennial rye, is really good. Well, uh, perennial rye. Um, what about clover? Clover's good, but it's hard to get established. You have to make sure that your clover is inoculated with because the inoculation helps with the nitrogen gets it to grow. But clover usually likes a little bit better soil. So for the tough soil, rye grass is the better approach. Yes. What's the extract? Is that What's the what? The best ground cover. Which the best like, ground cover. I just heard of, like grass is somewhat contentious, and so is that better than not? It's well, I mean, the right people thing. like, I mean, I don't, I get at, you know, you got kids and grandkids, you want a couple of lots of plants. So uh, there are some drought tolerant grasses. I know Pennington Seed makes a drought tolerant seed mix that's available at like a Lowe's and Home Depot. So it's called Smart Seed. And you can use 40% less water. So that's a good way to get an Avalon, take the drought tolerant on mix. And it's better to have a mix of seed. And, uh, and that's the other problem with clover is it does take a lot of water to keep it established and keep it stuff. So it's fine. Yes? A couple of questions. <clears throat> I um, make sort of like a compost tea. Is, am I doing the same thing as inoculating with mycorrhizal? Is that sort of. Yeah, the compost tea are great because they're full of lice. And if it's bacteria, not fungi, it's not mycorrhizal fungi. So the. When you make compost, it gets above 140 degrees. Right. So that kills the mycorrhizal fungal component. But it's a great way to add beneficial bacteria. Okay. And it does have high levels of carbon. It stimulates root growth, which more roots you have, more carbon you have stored in the soil. So compost teams are great, but the mycorrhizal would be extra. Okay. Still going to do that. Yeah. Um, and then I have my yard, I have a back half. Doesn't get any treatment on it, gets mowed once it regrads and stuff. I kind of assume there's mycorrhizal in that. Yeah. Is that a fair assumption, or is that something you should all think of applying it regardless of what we have in our yards? Yeah, if it's a natural area and it's been natural and it's been in cover for you know 10 or 20 years, probably have adequate populations of mycorrhizal. Okay. So it's the recently disturbed areas or the or the areas that you use a lot of chemicals, those are the ones that really definitely come biologically. Yes. Well, two questions. One is, what's the best way to inoculate? You said that there are several kinds of granted in different ways. Is there one that's better than others to inoculate your? Um, yeah, the, the question was, what's the best way to inoculate with mycorrhizal okay. fungi? And it really depends on your situation. So if you're transplanting like a plant, just put it in the planting coral, and the granular uh, form is really good. You just put it around the roots. If it's an existing plant, then you have to kind of water it in, so it's better to have a powder or a liquid for that. So if it's an existing plant, so if you see a plant struggling, say it's a you know tree that you really like in your yard, try that first before you call in a real expensive tree surgeon or somebody like that, because a lot of times it's the roots that are the problem, and you can solve that pretty easily. My second question was: Is there one type of manure that is better than others? What? One type of manure that is better than Oh, yeah. Aged manure is better than fresh manure. So the older it is, the better it is. Because it gets all the soluble nutrients out of that. Out of the, the real raw manures have a lot of nitrates floating around in that, in that farm to the soil. You're better off letting that age leach out so it's stable forms of meat. So age, that, always ask people with manure how old the manure is. It comes, sometimes you can just smell it. If it smells bad, 
It's right. toothbrush. <laughs> yes. What about the fishing mold? Fishing mold is good. It stimulates a lot of, yeah, it's organic forms of nitrogen, for example, and phosphorus. Yeah, it's mostly really good. You don't need a lot of it. You don't need a lot of fish mold yourself, but a little bit goes a long way. It's really energizing. I didn't realize you guys were sitting in the master class or whatever. <laughs> but last year, so it's so hard to you alive. Do you or do you know someone that you can recommend to come to a consultation? Um, do I know? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the problem. <laughs> The problem with a lot of the big box stores is that you don't really get that kind of expertise at the big box store anymore. But like Edit Redwood Nursery is really good. Uh, the people at the Josephine Growers Co ops are usually really good at that in the section. So, those I would go to are like a hometown nursery. They're usually pretty good. Just remember Chet's? He used to be, that used to be great. Those are the information. But Ed is really good at Redwood Nursery, and his staff is really good. But if you go to like Home Depot or Lowe's, you're not going to get a little. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know. Yes. You know that property at the northeast corner of Booth and Hess? They're always throwing stuff in these big white bags. I'm always curious what exactly are they throwing and where they use from. So that was, I used to know those people. <laughs> so each one of those bags was a thousand pounds. So you had like five hundred bags. So we grew a half a pound of granular material. And so we were growing mycorrhizal fungi in those bags and we were feeding them so they would produce a little forage of the seeds. And we were growing them with the C5 grass that put a lot of carbon into the, into the soil and it's not really basically. What we're doing is what I was suggesting here. And that's how I know about this carbon to the soil. Because in one year, you would add four or five percent carbon to the soil, which is like 20,000 pounds of carbon. Crazy. It's crazy how it would actually change the color of the soil. So that's what got me so excited about this. We did that for 15 or 20 years. And we still do it. But uh, yeah, it was remarkable. So basically, it's kitty litter. And I'm treating kitty litter as little granular. Allowed, allowed, allowed a lot of air and water into the soil. And we grew with like, like corn. It's corn. It's like a seed by grass like corn. We just took as much carbon as possible out of the atmosphere. Seed by grass is take the maximum amount of carbon out of the atmosphere. And they allocate it to the plants. Yeah, that was the idea. Yes. Well, so that you're telling me that it's okay then to grow my lawn, and you know, with the, everybody's discouraging. Going back to the natural landscape, you're telling me that I can now say that I'm going to lawn. Yeah, lawns are actually, you can, as long as you're not, you know, using a lot of chemical fertilizer, lawns could be a good thing for lawns grown organically, could be a great thing for so on, and especially if you have a drought and just the lawn, it's not using a lot of water. So, oh, what? Lawn, the seed is part of the deep. That's the yeah, they bred a lot of they bred a lot of fescues too for drought resistance. So like that Pennington mix, and you can see them online too. You can get a drought. And the nice thing about that is this requires as much air. So you don't have to yeah. And you know the lawns that are like purple green healthy, those are not good. Yeah. All that extra nutrients are going into your knee as well. Of the Rogue River itself. Yes. Oh, it's biochar is amazing. The coolest thing you could ever do is look at biochar on a tripod on microscope. It's incredible. You can come with pores and stuff, and there's all kinds of stuff growing in it and it's like perfect habitat and it's pure carbon so you need product if you look at a product reading list and that's biochar and you know those people really know what they're doing 
<laughs> and it only takes like one or two percent. It doesn't take a lot of outcharge to go a long way. So you don't need to add a lot, but even a little, it's like climbing up on your ladder to grab the tomato. Plant slower. That's right. We did uh, what we did Foundry Village, the landscaping part, we added her biochar to the um, fertilizer with mycorrhizal. <laughs> yeah, biochar is Yes. Uh, I know you would like the mushroom. <laughs> and uh, how do I get federal mushrooms to grow in my pack? <laughs> I love it. I care. I care. Do you like eating those? Of course. He's a great mushroom. Um, I don't know. You know, they have kids where you can buy them on silly, probably. My kids for stuff. I don't know. I don't know how big the kids I know they have kids in my silly block. I've got, yeah. So, good luck with that. <laughs> One more. Anybody else? Hey, thanks. You guys are going to be right through here. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And uh, we didn't say it before, but you're a sponsor for Forest Fest. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to take out uh, our own Doug Walker back in the mix. Watch out. You're all going to have to donate today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a donation skit today. We'll just have to do it anyway. Right? Um, so, in, in a, the next installment of Get to Know Rotarian, um, I sent out a really well researched and thought out survey <laughs> to 20 rotary members, and I got 10 responses. <laughs> and it was all about sauces in the refrigerator, because we want to know about everybody's sauces and whatnot. Um, I read it, I, I didn't really read it, but I saw a headline that said uh, it was a, that it's a crisis in America. Where, we're having too many sauces in our fridge and everything. So that kind of got me down that, that uh, pathway. So Tim Sweeney just walked out a minute ago. He, he was the first response to my one of my many questions about sauces and uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, important answers and stuff. But anyway, Tim is not here, but he is, for some of you who don't know, he is the superintendent of our schools. He's a new member. He was here from the coast. And um, I can't get anything else to say about it, but he's, his, uh, Soft he thought was the worst ever was a truffle oil sauce. Um, strange sauce, strange use of sauce was kept on the I did not believe that one. That sounds pretty weird. Um, Margaret is here. Margaret has been a member for a long time. Some of you who are new. Her background is writing. She wrote for the newspaper quite a while. Probably did freelance writing. She also worked for RCC and the foundation. She's also a fantastic river guy. Did you do that for Pepper and Margaret? No, you should have. You should have. Margaret also runs the river. Um, Margaret uh, has a lot to brag about. She makes a bunch of homemade stuff. So, we're going to be healthy and more things like that. Best response to one of the questions was uh, from Margaret. I, one of the questions was getting comments or suggestions. And she says, Does getting sauce count? Let's <laughs> talk about getting sauce. Um, <clears throat> Dawn, uh, Dawn's brag sauce, the sauce she wants to brag about is divine lily koi marinade. Is Dawn here? She's out of town. She's out of town. She's going to have to explain what that is. I don't know what that is, but it sounds interesting. Um, Dawn Sparrow, who's here, and who will go to her house. Some of you are going to her house this evening. Thank you. Thank you. There she is. Thank you, Dawn, for that. It's very nice of you. Um, barbecue sauces are the best. She loves mild and spicy barbecue sauce. Um, Leonora's not here, but I'd love to tease her. She just sent me a one word answer oyster sauce. I don't know what the answer to what the question it was. The favorite, the worst, the worst, ugliest, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Um, Mary Merillard's top, top favorite sauce is River Road Barbecue, Red Robin Campfire, and then uh, anything without the top of the box. Um, Patty Toronto just had a bunch of. Weird sauces. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Bela, who is a fantastic CPA, and you know, you, you would want your CPA to answer the way he did. Of the seven questions, 
pretty much all of them said it's just parents. It's complicated. And that's that's literally how we answer pretty much all of them. Uh, okay. And then uh we're just soft in the crib and said, why would I buy a weird sauce? <laughs> He says, I'm normal. I have the best sauce in my food. Everybody says so. Okay. Um, odd fact off the internet. Most expensive sauces, I Googled that up. Manuka honey from New Zealand. So, batch of Manuka honey, uh, limited run of 1,000 very small jars. And they were about $1,400 for a jar. A jar. Your jar of honey. Saving money. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what's so good about it. Yeah, apparently, good the good other thing is that, yeah, good for herself, Excelma, it's, it's got the highest levels of MGO and UMF ratings in the world. And I don't know what that means, but I can prove it up. <laughs> can't, can't help it there. Okay, one of the other real expensive ones was something called Swamp Dragon. It was made from hot sauces and some very expensive private rums. Maybe it's $1,300 for a bottle. Very expensive. Um, balsamic vinegar. I kind of expected this to be out there somewhere. Was a good balsamic vinegar, vinegar, and the one that popped up was three hundred fifty dollars a bottle. Yeah, yeah. pretty expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah, but good, good, uh, good ones. Okay, so I also made some sauces for those who are going to want to try some. I made three sauces, and I made something called monkey sauce, something from South Africa. I made something called kiwi mayo. And then I made something called banana ketchup. Now, banana ketchup is pretty obvious, so I'm not going to ask you what, what you think you're doing that. But what do you think is in the monkey sauce? Banana ketchup. Monkey Monkey bars? No, it's kind of a barbecue. Um, it's what it is. It's very, very common in South Africa. How about keepy? I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Keep keep mayo. Keep pie mayo. Anybody? It's it's Japanese mayonnaise and it's made with uh wasabi and horseradish. Uh, no, actually the recipe I used to make I made some, but it's not that. And it's white wine vinegar and it's the egg yolk versus the egg white. So it's much creamy. Um, although I made it with olive oil, and olive oil is not too much flavor, so it's a little bit olive oil and nutty. But anyway, um, I have that over there for those who want to try. Here fries, chips. And we have some um, bell peppers. We'll pick it out and then when we're done. Okay. That is kind of it for my Saturday morning. I don't know. Get to know people. Um, any uh, happy thoughts? Summit, Roger. So I had to find happy thoughts for two worlds. Hang on. I always hope so. Speaking of So I'm sure you'll want to do what you can have. Right. And he said $50, so $20 here for um, Asker Room. Oh. Uh, historically, over the mid 80s, that women were invited to go to the And the very first woman who became a real career in the Greens class, against my good friend Phil Hart's uh, solutions, was Anne Gaskin. Oh. So I feel we come full circle here. Isn't that funny? What you guys don't know is that she did all that stuff, but she didn't want to have to stay home and do any kind of housework. Pretty good trade Oh, something to say. Some of the happy bucks are for Mike and the presentation. We obviously learned something, and it's, uh, it's a delight. I also have happy bucks for, for Steve Rowe. Um, I was had a conference up at, in um, Seattle area this week, and it was on performance excellence and how do you grow a culture of performance excellence and, and change a culture. And they kept talking about the, the importance of, of working together and um, optimistic hope. And one of the things that we had as swag to give away were pictures of hope the coloring book picture and the color crayons, and we talked about the importance, and we handed out the new matter cards. And that was, it was, and we had so much feedback on it. That was the best giveaway because everybody's got enough, you know, name tags and whatnots to have in their in their um, ownership. But they, they thought that was just a great thing. So thank you, Steve, for letting us share that. <laughs>
Um, I will, I'm happy. My happy books are for um, a trip to Portugal. We just got back. We went through in travel and um, Suzanne and up on the board there, just her name. <laughs> she was the one that uh, suggested it. We went with Suzanne and Joe and it was a ton of fun. So that's what my happy books are for. Yeah, we got it. I'm still waiting for the report on how much miles we get to walk in the tour. I don't know what it's I have five happy bucks. First of all, for what Judy told us about Porch Fest compared to Medford, that's so awesome. <laughs> Secondly, for Mike telling people you do not need to be shamed by your lawn. <laughs> But I don't think Mike realized how many people had pens and paper out and <laughs> writing as fast as we could to try to get what we branch should be planted, what kind of this and that. Thank you for your expertise and for living in this community. I have five happy books. I submitted them via PayPal. <laughs> I don't get any cash. <laughs> um, I'm just I'm excited to bring Steve here to meet you all. Um, I get to talk all the time about being a Rotarian because um, I bring it up whenever I can. And people ask me, well, if you don't live in Grants Pass, why are you a member in Grants Pass? And I say, because I toured all of the Rotaries, and this one is the best one. <laughs> Yeah, I have uh, five sad books. So my book. Yeah, I just I I thank you much. I mean, I I love to grow and garden and do all that. And it's just like I said, I was know people can write them down and taking pictures because I love to get that information. So we do get our blessed to have you know community. And I also got back and visiting my grandchildren. And I always used to go and make um, my baby turn double digit 10. So I was able to go to soccer games and I can go to cheerleading, middle school cheerleaders are 39 members. Can you imagine? <laughs> and I learned that Westland is, I thought Grants Pass was a football town. And then I went to Westland football and it was almost like, oh my gosh. So good, bad, whatever. But it was it was interesting seeing, seeing that. I just want to thank Steve for coming. And it just dawned on me, I was struck how there's so much overlap in the things we talk about and what occurs. And the things that we learned from Mike today um, about combating some of the, the effects of climate change and then the kind of work we're doing at the Land Conservancy, um, preserving all these lands, which are incredible lands. You should see them. Um, anyway, I'm just happy. And thanks, Mike, and thanks, Steve, for coming. I had a couple happy bucks for my grandma because she was up there that she got off and so we could say it while she was on. Um, but she provided me some good comedy, comedy relief this week. Um, for those of you who know my grandma, she's not such a good nature woman. Um, and she texted me about two days ago at 11 30 at night that a bat had flown into her house while she was letting her little dog outside. So I woke up to that, and a couple hours later, I woke up to another that sees a picture of that. So she somehow got that bat out of her house. And so I get this picture of my grandma running around with the little tree. So it's for my grandma. I and, and so we're not all the time, and, 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 and somebody knows you guys would like to see what's doing. Uh, anyone else? No? Yeah, I got a, a, a sad bar for my yeah. city. Uh, he was a lovely human being that was always involved and willing to be there and do things. We're going to miss him. Um, card, yeah, card draw, please. Do you have a box of cards? And I throw this box on somebody like mine. Um, and then also, I have a happy box because that trip to Portugal with Dad and the gang was a lot of fun. And one of the nice things about the food, Mike, <laughs> one of the nice things about the food that we experienced was how simple the cooking was. And how many times we had wonderful food that just had about, just had tomato, garlic, olive oil, parsley, salt, and pepper in it, and how delicious that was. I got to learn to use less spices. That one, probably?
Uh, the winner is the Jack of Hearts. And so I have um, uh, an end ketchup up there, Hebrew sauce, and then the uh, monkey sauce up here for Noah's Thank you. That was great. What a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Mike, hello. We definitely say, of course, you're invited to join our club, but in the absence thereof, would you please come every quarter? And the answer that Lisa was looking for was, please go to her house. <laughs> and I want that too, because I'll do whatever you tell me. So, um, okay, thank you. Good. That was great. You guys can often taste that, all that stuff. And you should know also, Mike, we had a lot of guests today, a larger crowd than usual, because you're really popular. And our club is getting more popular, but it's just really nice to see that. And so thanks to all of you. Okay, thoughts for the day before we wrap it up. Um, this isn't true for all of us, but I think it's a good quote. All I have learned, I learned from books. And that's from Abraham Lincoln. See you next week. <laughs>